Hi everyone, welcome to part 8 of my Z80 computer series. In this series of videos I'm attempting to design and build my own Z80 retro 8-bit computer. In the previous videos I've been working on this trainer board which runs the Z80 at very slow speeds and it has various indicators so that I can see what is going on. The main purpose of this board is so that I can learn how the Z80 works. So eventually I'm going to design a full computer which is going to be more general purpose and running at faster speeds. It won't have any of these indicator lights or these outputs here. Instead it will connect to a, a hopefully a VGA display monitor and it's going to have a full keyboard. I, I briefly sort of showed you a little bit about my thoughts on that in the last video. Just before we get into the um, schematic I wanted to quickly show you the community section on my channel and you can find that here and this is an area where I'm trying to post a few things about what I'm doing to try and get a little bit more interaction with my viewers. Um, it's, it's an area where I can ask you what you think about things and you can give me feedback. I can show you photographs of what I'm doing. Um, and one thing that I really wanted to point out was somebody asked me for schematics for my trainer board. Um, and at the time I didn't have any. But since then what I've done is I've created a GitHub repository. And you should be able to find the link here in the community section. And if you click on the link, it should take you to the current schematic. Now it is subject to change because as the computer evolves, I'll keep updating it. Um, I believe it's generally correct, um, although each time I look at it, I do think I've found a, some small mistakes. So if you notice anything wrong, then please point them out. Um, I have reworked the schematic a bit um, as it's changed over as the videos have gone on. This was essentially the, the schematic from episode one and I've removed all the LED indicators from this page. They've, they've moved onto page five and I've also changed the pull-up resistors to a resistor network rather than individual resistors because that's how it is built on the actual trainer board. And I'm just connecting the um, address lines and the data lines to a bus which goes around the other pages of the, the diagram. Some of the numbering may have changed as well on the on the part numbers. Um, I just did that because I've, I've pulled everything together and I've tried to reorganize the numbering. So there's page two. That was the uh, memory circuits that we looked at. I forget which episode that was. Um, I've just added things like decoupling capacitors. Um, and there is a reservoir capacitor there because I think when I was reading the data sheets on the memory chips, it recommended putting a capacitor somewhere in the vicinity of, of the chips. Um, we've then got, uh, these are the input circuits. We're going to look at those in this video, so I'll skip over them for now. And these are the output circuits um, with the seven segment LEDs. Again, we've seen this before. Um, just added some decoupling capacitors. And these are all the indicator lights. They've now got their own page and they, I'm showing you how I'm using my resistor networks to um, connect them together. I'm trying to think if maybe this was wrong. I think I made a mistake here. I think this should be, um, I think it's been drawn the wrong way around. I think the um, diode should be pointing away from the, the resistor network. So this is a mistake. Yeah, those diodes are around the wrong way. So I'll get that corrected. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that that was there. So whilst we're here, we might as well take a look at this uh, input schematic. I'll try and bring it up a little bit. So what's going on here? I've got um, five volts coming in at the top. There's a resistor network there. Um, I believe that part number is a 10K um, resistor network. So each of these resistors is a 10K resistor. Um, they're there just to pull all the, the lines high. If we would just follow one down, you'll see it comes down to one side of the switch and the other side of the switch is just connected down to ground. So when the switch is open, like it's shown here, the 
pull up resistor will pull the line high so if we follow it right across here this input here on this um, 74 LS244 um, will be high uh, but if we close the switch then it will go low so all of these switches work the same way they've all got their own pull up resistors so the lines will be pulled high until we press one of the switches and then that particular line will go low and of course we can press multiple switches at the same time the lines will just go high and low indicating whether the um, switches are open or closed um, so I just explain a very little bit about this um, 74244 chip I think I've, I've put LS on the diagram I think I'm intending to use HC versions of the of the chips um, I believe either would work um, and possibly the, the numbering here uh, might differ between manufacturers so um, you should get the general idea I, I did a previous video on the 74244 um, buffer chip these are called buffers um, so if you could if you want to know more about that you could go and look at that but I'll just very briefly explain basically the way it works um, they're actually organized into two sets of four so you'll see some of the inputs start with the number one and some start with the number two so that's the first set of four buffers and this is the second set of four buffers um, and there's an enable line for each each bank of four so the the not one G is controlling the first four and the not two G is controlling the second four. Um, I've just tied them together. We'll get into this circuit in a second. Um, but basically, when these enable lines are pulled low, um, whatever is on the inputs here will appear on the outputs. So when we pull these low, the signal kind of is allowed through the chip and can get to the data lines of the Z80 data bus. Um, but when these lines, these enable lines are high, you can kind of think of it that it cuts it off. Um, so uh, all the outputs go to like a high impedance state, which is essentially isolating the, the input parts of the circuit. So no matter what they're doing, they won't have any effect on the data bus, which frees it up to do other stuff. So we only want to pull these low when we do actually want to read um, the inputs from the switches, but all other times we want that high. So the only time we want that low, if we come down and look at this logic, we only want this line to go low when the I.O. request line is low and the read line is low. Um, and this is an OR gate. Um, so if either or either one of these or the other is high, then we're going to get an out high output. So the only way the output can go low is when both the inputs go low. And, and that's what we want. When these both go low, these enable lines will get pulled low and the signals will be allowed to pass through. If any of these lines go high, this enable line here will go high and the, the, this part of the circuit will essentially be isolated. So next I want to create a very, very basic program that will uh, allow us to test that circuit. Um, so we just want to do some reading of input. Um, and, but I want to um, start scaling things up a little bit in the very near future. So I'm starting to think about using an assembler. I think I alluded to that in the previous video. Um, so I'll just show you the process here in a little bit more detail. So this is asm80.com. Um, and we probably should do a detailed video on this at some point, but I'm, I'm just going to try and stay on track and keep looking at my input circuits. And I think there's there's my program here. So you can save the. I think these files are saved into like a local cache on on my machine. Um, so they are actually quite at risk of, of if I clear the cache. I think they'll all vanish. Um, but I think you do get an option to. Uh, you've got this um, local workspace. I think that's where you can save things more permanently. Um, whereas this is just sort of my browser workspace. More more of a very temporary um, location but we'll look at that another day um, for now I've got this input program here now um, um, something I will uh, mention again is this bin 2 directive so the compiler directives seem to start with a dot um, at some point again we'll go over all, um, all the compiler directives but um, we're just using this one bin 2 
32768, that's how many bytes are in a 32K chip. So um, I have a 32K ROM, so that's that's why that's there. Um, I did say to you previously I didn't have this, and by default it will generate a, a binary file for a 64K chip. So if you've got a 32K chip, or you might have 16K or whatever, you need to specify here how big you want your binary file. Um, org is a it's another compiler directive, I believe. Um, it just tells us the origin of where we want the program to be placed in memory. So we're saying we want it at 0000, so right at the bottom of memory, I think you would call that. Um, and this is just a label, loop. Um, and what am I doing here? I'm doing load C, comma, 00. zero. That's input port zero. Now I'm actually not using any addressing yet. You didn't see any addressing on that circuit diagram I just showed you. I'm not using any, so it doesn't matter which port I read from, I'm always gonna get those um, input switches. If we added a second import device, then we would need to look at the addressing, and this would become more important. Um, and then I'm just doing an in D comma C, so I'm reading from, from port C, which is um, zero, 00, but I just said it's irrelevant anyway. Um, and the contents will be put into register D, but again, it's irrelevant because I'm not using the register. All I want to do is actually just see an, an input instruction ex executing um, when we single step through the program. Um, this program just uh, then just jumps back to the loop and just keeps repeatedly doing that. But I'm only really interested in the, the input instruction right now. So what I would do next is I would go download bin. And this actually tells me, uh, okay, nine line compiled to the input.z80.bin file. And you can see it's downloaded it here. So I'm just gonna rename that file. So it's just gonna be called input.z80. And I'm going to put it in my Steve folder, which is my home directory. So what I do next is, um, with the power turned off, obviously, I take the uh, EEPROM chip out of the SIF socket and I move it over to the Tommy Prom board. Lock it down again. Um, and then I just plug this USB lead into my laptop. Okay, I've now opened up the command line. I've got the Tommy Prom plugged in. I've renamed that file, that binary file we downloaded and I put it in this folder. We should be able to see it here. Input Z80, there it is. Um, now I've stopped using the serial tools and I'm now using the screen program. Screen seems to be installed on the Mac by default. Um, if you're using Windows, I'm guessing you're probably gonna need a different solution, but I'm using a Mac and this is working for me. Um, so we type screen and then I believe we have to type forward slash dev, I'm trying to remember this now, TTY. Um, yeah, so it's tty.usb serial and I'm just, when I hit the tab key, it, it fills the rest of it in for me. Um, this is just the device that appears when you uh, plug something into the USB serial port. Um, and then we need the board rate, which I've got to try and remember. I think it's 115200. Press enter. That should connect to the Tommy Prom. Um, we can hit enter again. Just confirm there's the Tommy Prom. Um, what's next? We hit W for writing to device from X mode MCRC file. So X mode M is a protocol um, for, for transferring files. Um, I think there are there are multiple protocols they're called X, Y, and Z modem, but we're using X modem. Um, so we type W, press enter, and then I press Control A, and then press uh, a colon or type a colon. Then I type exec space bang bang space L S Z dash B for binary dash X for the X modem protocol and then input dot Z80 is my file. I press enter and that will send the file to the Tommy Prom. Um, so it's got 32k to send. 
This is in real time. I've not speeded the video up. There we go, 32K, byte sent, 32768, which is um, how big we said that we wanted our binary file. So that's all successful. So now if I press D to dump, it should show us the, the contents of the memory. It's a very small program just here at the top. Um, we've got 0E00ED50C3. Um, possible that the 00 is also part of the program I'm not sure um, so what I'll do next is I'll uh, disconnect the USB and move the chip back into the trainer board So if I just quickly show you the uh, breadboard, if I move things around, we might get a better view of the breadboard. Let's just disconnect that for the minute. Just briefly explain what I've got here. It's basically the circuit we saw on the diagram. The wires fell out. So what I've got is, um, I've actually labeled this up now because I was getting really annoyed with myself that I couldn't remember what connection was what. Um, I've got 5 volt and ground um, are the first two connections, they're just powering this breadboard. Um, I've got a few uh, input switches here, now I've only got four, I haven't got the full eight that were shown on the diagram. And I'm using uh, individual resistors, I'm just doing that because it just fits the, the switches better on the breadboard. Once we move it over to the actual trainer board we'll go back to a resistor network and I'll put all eight switches in. Um, the uh, black lines here are just connecting the other side of the switches down to ground and then the orange lines come across to the chip. They're feeding the inputs to the um, 74244 buffer chip. Um, again, refer back to the diagram rather than trying to see what's going on with this breadboard. Um, I've also got the green lines here. These are the eight data lines coming out of the buffer chip going over to the um, the data bus. Uh, the yellow lines are the enable lines, two, two of them here, and they're coming across here to a, a sort of central point. That's actually the output of the OR gate, so this is an OR gate. Um, and the um, I'm also tied off of there, off the same point as with those two yellow enable lines, I've just pulled off um, uh, an LED. Um, the LED is connected to um, the five volts, current limiting resistor, and then goes down to that um, enable line there. So when the enable line goes low, the light will come on. Um, the two inputs to the OR gate are these two yellow connections here, and they're going to the read connection. I'm not sure if you can see that, it's quite small. And the IO request connections. Um, one last thing to mention, because I've only got four switches on here, what I've done, um, the other four inputs on the buffer chip, um, you can see those tiny little red um, links that are down in there. Um, they're just connecting all the other inputs together and then I've got a red line pulling them up to the to the 5 volt rail. Um, I have to do that. I can't just pull up the unused um, data lines up to 5 volts because we don't want to interfere with the data bus when it's doing other things. Um, so we do it on the input of the buffer chip. Um, so when the buffer chip is enabled, it will read these four switches and the other four lines will just appear as high. So if I move this back around, we should be able to power up. Clip that on there. Give it some power. Um, I think we're in single step mode. I'm just going to make sure that we are absolutely certain that we're re fully reset. And then I'll start single stepping through. So it's three, three clock pulses, 
and what we're seeing, um, we, we're getting an M1 light that tells us that we're doing a fetch. Um, a, a, we're fetching an instruction from memory. We can see it's doing a read and a, a memory request. And uh, the, the address line is zero, so we're reading from memory address zero. And what it's reading back is zero E. So four lights are out is zero, and then these three lights here, that's E. So that's the first byte. I'll keep uh, stepping through. I'm trying to think what the instruction was. I think it was load C comma zero. So the next thing it should do, next time we see the M1 light, maybe I missed it. Um, I'll keep going. There's the M1 light again. I think I missed one. Um, so it's now reading from uh, memory location two, because we did zero, I, I missed number one. It's are now doing number two. Um, which should be E, D, and again that looks like that is E, and this is this is D. Um, I'll keep stepping. So now we're doing a memory read from address 3, and what are we expecting? We're expecting five zero. Um, yeah, this is this is four plus one is five, and this is a zero. So we should be getting there. So this is our this is our read instruction. So I/O request line low the um, read line is low so that's going into our or, or gate those two signals coming into the or gate and then out of the or gate we should see that this light is lit which means the buffer chip is enabled which should mean that these switches now control the data lines now you see the data lines are all lit up so they're all um, high and if I press them there's the first switch working here there's the second switch looks good the third switch is good and the fourth switch is good um, all the others are tied high permanently so I can't check them but what I should be able to do is press multiple switches at once I'm going to try and press all four can't quite get my fingers on them there you go there's all four pressed oh, I can release them there's all four released so the input seems to be to be working when we're in that that read state um, one thing I did want to try if I continue stepping through as soon as these um, um, read conditions go out so the IO line and the read line are now both high the data bus should now be um, back in the control of the the Z80 or whatever it whatever it's doing um, and if I press the buttons now the input switches now we should see that they don't have any effect on the data line quite convenient it's only the first four I can manipulate and two of them are on and two of them are off. And as I'm pressing the, the buttons, you can see nothing's happening. And that's because um, the the buffer chip is disabled because we can see we don't have a, a light here. Um, so it's gone into high impedance state and isolated the signals. So that's all I really wanted to show, um, just proving that the, the input circuit works. So where I'm thinking of uh, going with this next is I will uh, transfer all of these circuits over onto the onto the trainer board to make them a bit more permanent so we don't have this mess here and we can have all all eight switches I've got four here I'll have to add four more um, so I can I can do all that soldering and connecting up the wires but I'm, I've been thinking about it what I was planning to do was a, a slightly more sophisticated program um, where we can use um, two of the buttons now up till now we've mainly been kind of um, reading from an address and then displaying the output on these um, output displays here um, but what we've been doing is just sort of starting at one memory address and then just increasing to the next memory address and then increasing to the next one increasing to the next one which is kind of um, boring and useless um, so what I was hoping we could do is just to take that one little step further and say 
if we started at a memory address, say somewhere in the middle, like memory address 8000, um, and not have it automatically incrementing, we could then use the buttons. We could use um, one button to decrement the memory address and it will show us the contents of it. And we can use the other button to increment the memory address. So we can move backwards and forwards through memory however we want, looking at the contents. Um, and, and that would demonstrate that um, as well as output, we can use input. Um, but I've been thinking about it and I think it's gonna be quite tricky with such a slow clock speeds because um, there's going to be kind of a, 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 I guess it's going to be a long period where we have to be um, holding the switch down for that period. Um, and it might be a, a little confusing to us trying to use it, knowing that we've got to press the buttons at exactly the right time. Um, that's, that's going to be a bit tedious. So I think we really want the um, Z80 running at a, more of a full speed. Um, we don't have to go too fast. Um, I'm a little bit worried about all the wiring on the back. It's probably not going to handle high frequencies. Um, and I'm thinking typically we'll run the Z80 at somewhere like 3 or 4 megahertz. But just for the purpose of this, for now, on this training board, I'm thinking even 1 megahertz would, would be enough and possibly even slower than that, maybe maybe half a, half a megahertz would be fast enough just to demonstrate these these input switches. So I think what I'm going to do next is... Um, just go back and have a look at some of my, my previous clock circuits. I think at some point I had a, a faster clock that I should just be able to connect it up to the clock line here. I can turn these two clocks off and connect a faster clock in on this pin and it should make this system run faster. And then I think once I've got that working, um, I'll move to a slightly more sophisticated program where we can use sort of buttons to, to move around. So that'll probably be um, in the next video. So leave this here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.